Good evening and welcome everyone. Welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table here at the Exploratorium. Tonight, Neon. Yay, Neon! I hope everybody has their uh, collectible Neon card out there. And I hope that you have been, how many people have the whole set of, starting at Hydrogen, have the whole set? I want to know how many people here were, were here for the first. So now, by now, you should have what? Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and tonight, neon. So collect them all. We don't have any more hydrogens left, so the hydrogens are getting kind of rare now, and I think it's going to happen even more and more, so be sure you come every month to this. Tonight, again, we're going to be doing neon, and uh, I'll, I have a little bit of element news that we want to talk about that I'll uh, reveal in just a bit. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about neon for a while, and then I'm going to introduce Ed Kirshner, who is a uh, plasma sculpture uh, artist, and uh, Ed uh, is a... Uh, He's currently on the faculty of the Crucible Fine Arts School in Oakland and is the trustee and treasurer of the Museum of Neon Art, Mona, in Los Angeles. And then uh, just outside the webcast studio, I hope you all had a chance to uh, look at the book. Uh, there's a book out there called San Francisco Neon by Al Barna and Randall Ann Homan. And uh, if you want to take a look at that book, and tonight the authors are here, so you can actually get a nice signed copy as well. So, and they are actually... Uh, they also have walking tours of San Francisco, neon walking tours of San Francisco. So be sure to go out there and ask them about that as well. So tonight, we're going to talk about neon. But before we get there, let's go to the periodic table. And OK, my little remote control is not working. Let's just use the space bar then. And that's not working either. OK, let's try that one more time. There we go. So there's the periodic table that we're all familiar with. By the way, this periodic table online, periodictable.com. Please go visit uh, Teo Gray's wonderful Element website. Um, before we get to Neon, though, you may have remember that there actually were elements in the news. I don't get to say that very often. There, were a, there was a discovery of four, well, an announcement of four new elements. 113 un un trium, 115 un un pentium, 117 un un septium, and 118 un un actium. Now, right now, those are just generic names, un un actium, 118. Um, and they will get new names soon. Uh, that has to be approved by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And once they, they, have, they have said these elements actually exist, there have been discoveries discoveries and then confirmations of those discoveries, and now the people who discover them get to name them. I, for one, am very much in favor of Tom Larium because he did the famous Elements song, but uh, we'll all have to vote on that, I think. I don't think I'm going to win. Um, I wanted to talk about just a little bit about these tonight because they're so far out in the Everything Matters Tales from the Periodic Table uh, lecture series that we actually won't get to them uh, for eight years and seven months. So, and it won't be news at that point. So, and there may be new elements by that time. So I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about these four elements tonight. We don't know that much about them. Um, since we, uh, and uh, so let's just do that. If you look back at that periodic table, all the elements that we know of in nature are the first 92 elements. So all the ones you see here in uh, yellow are the, uh, the elements that exist in nature, up to the number 92 down there, which is uranium. Everything past that that you see now in red, everything past that is manufactured, either in a reactor or in an accelerator. And now we have elements 93 all the way up to element 118. It looks like we have completed, finally, the periodic table. <laughs> it's done. We're done. No, actually, that's not true. Because we can always add to the periodic table by just adding another row. So we just add another row onto the periodic table. 
the three bottom ones actually, the three bottom rows go in that little slot um, right in the third, third column there. It kind of, kind of sticks out, you can think of it. Um, and so we actually can do that, all these nice new elements. We can actually then as start assigning them numbers as well. And you can see here that we can actually get out uh, another, what, uh, we'll do the uh, eighth row by uh, in 11 years and three months. We'll finish this up in April of 2027. I'll be 73 and a half. So uh, we have a lot to work on here. None of those blue ones have yet been discovered. But what about these ones that we have looked, seen? Um, for instance, how does it made? Mo most of these have been made at this uh, place you see here over on the left. It's the uh, Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, Russia. And uh, they are responsible actually for three of the four elements. And the way they make it is by smashing atoms together. So, for instance, if you smash an americium atom, which is a very heavy atom, that has to be made in a reactor, actually, and calcium, they will merge into a single atom. Now, you look here, you see americium, AM, has a 95. That's how many protons are in its nucleus. Calcium has 20 protons in its nucleus. When you smash them together, you get un un pentium which has 100, you add 95 and 20, you get 115. And uh, that, by the way, just gives off a few neutrons, so you lose a few neutrons in there. So the total of number of neutrons is a little less than the combination of the two original atoms. And that's how you make un un pentium. This, by the way, is not, none of these elements are stable, they're all radioactive. Un un pentium actually decays by giving off an alpha particle into un un trium, into element 113. So, sorry, 116. Is that correct? No, 113, yes. 113 is what you get when you take two away from 115. That's correct. So actually, you can make one of these extra heavy elements, ultra heavy elements with the other, just by letting it decay. They fire these, uh, these calcium atoms at a target at the rate of like 10 to the 19th of them per second, and yet they make maybe one atom of un un pentium, in this case, every month. So, it's a long process. We'll never actually have a lump of un un pentium, and you probably wouldn't want to be in the same room with it anyway. If we look at the four elements, here's sort of how they make them. Uh, un un trium, you can make by smashing bismuth with zinc. Uh, un un pentium, we already talked about, americium and calcium. Un un septium, by, with berkelium and calcium. And un un actium, with californium and Calcium. By the way, you notice americium, berkelium, californium. Those were all first synthesized, you know where, over in Berkeley, of course, at the uh, Lawrence, well, at that time it was called the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, but that became a dirty word, so now it's the Lawrence, it's the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, so uh, maybe they'll get a chance to name yet another one after Berkeley. Who knows? There's also Lawrencium, by the way, which is another element uh, that they named. So. We don't know a lot about these elements. We know that uh, when they were discovered, we know their half-life. And you can see actually that 113 has kind of a long half-life, 20 minutes, all the way down to unu and octium, which has five millisecond, five thousandths of a second half-life. So after five thousandths of a second, half of whatever you have is gone. That's what a half-life is. And there are a few known isotopes uh, of each of those, and we'll talk about isotopes in just a bit. But that's, I just wanted to give a quick review of the new news. Very very exciting, four new elements. We've completed that seventh row of the periodic table. So we're back to the elements, and tonight's subject is, of course, neon. And neon is a, uh, the 10th element in the table. It has 10 protons in the nucleus. Most neon has 10 neutrons as well, so it has an atomic weight of about 20. And uh, this word neon came, comes from the Greek, Greek word neos. There's neon in Greek. It comes from neos, which means new, because it was a new element. It was first synthesized by these two guys here, Sir William Ramsey and uh, Morris Travers. They um, discovered it by boiling away liquid air. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. I love the way this Sir William Ramsey worked in the lab. Look at that. Is that style or what? That is style, man. I have never seen a physicist dressed like that nowadays. They're more like what I, the way I'm dressed. So 
How do they find it? Well, you see we have all of these elements over on the uh, right side of the table here. And those all have different boiling points. You liquefy a bunch of air, make it very, very cold. And let's just take the top few here. And you would see that helium boils at 263 degrees below zero C. Neon, a little bit higher. 246. Argon, a little higher, 185. Krypton, a little higher, 153. And xenon, a little higher, 108. So if you get a bunch of liquefied gas and you start raising its temperature, the first one to boil off is going to be helium. So you collect it, store it away. The next thing to boil off is going to be neon. The next thing is argon, krypton, and xenon. We're not going to deal with radon tonight because it's, uh, you don't use that for much. As a matter of fact, you usually try to get rid of it. It can collect in your house. This method of allowing things to boil off is called fractional distillation. So if we started, I'm going to borrow some slides. If anybody was here for, how many people were here for hydrogen? A few people. So I'm going to borrow a couple of slides from uh, uh, one of our other speakers on the very first night. Um, and. Uh, Hopefully I have his permission to do this. If you start with 120 tons of liquefied air, that's a lot of liquefied air, 240,000 pounds of air. That would actually be a sphere about 44 feet in diameter. It's a lot of liquid air. Um, and you distill it, uh, you let the air part boil off, you would be left with about that much of argon, which is about a ton actually of argon. There's a, argon is about, uh, a little less than a percent of the atmosphere. If you let the argon boil away, you'd be left with about four pounds of neon, our element for tonight. And just to, for completeness, if you let the, arg the neon boil away, you would have about a quarter of a pound of uh, krypton, which is about one part per million in the atmosphere. And even less than that is xenon. You'd have about a 50th of a pound, uh, a third of an ounce. Uh, so about 87 parts per billion in the atmosphere. So xenon is pretty rare. If we look at the rareness of, we're gonna go back to neon here, of course. Neon is actually the fifth most common element in the universe after hydrogen, helium, carbon, and oxygen. So it's pretty common. It's made inside of large stars, uh, big stars, not stars like our sun, really. There's a little bit that's made in our sun, but not much. If you look at how much is in our sun, actually, in our sun, it's actually the sixth most abundant element in the sun. Our sun is made out of stuff that, from other stars that exploded. So we have a lot of iron in our sun that's a little, little bit more iron in our sun than we have neon. So it's the sixth most abundant in uh, the sun. Now, if you get down to the Earth, if we look in the Earth's oceans, it's the 39th most abundant element. So we're, there's not a lot on the Earth. Neon is pretty rare on the Earth. And if you look in the Earth's crust, you have to go way down. It's like the 75th most abundant element. <clears throat> Why is it so rare? Well, remember, neon doesn't actually f have any chemistry. It just stays neon. It doesn't combine with anything to form a rock that will stay inside of our so soil. As a matter of fact, neon is very light. And so at the temperature of the Earth, it actually cannot remain in our atmosphere. It just floats away, like helium does. One more thing is the human body. We're always interested in how much of an element is in the human body. Well, how much neon is in the human body? Actually, none. It's not necessary for life. So <clears throat> neon is uh, uh, very rare inside of us. You have to breathe it to get it in, the, in you. One interesting thing about neon, and I mentioned briefly the concept of isotopes when I was talking about the, um, uh, the new ultra-heavy elements. Isotopes are uh, the same element, the same number of protons in the nucleus, but different numbers of neutrons. It's the number of protons that decide what the element is, and it's the neutrons that just gives a little extra weight. Well, the interesting thing about neon is this guy, J.J. Thompson, um, in 1913 was passing neon atoms that he had stripped the electrons off of through uh, streaming them from a, 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 through a electric and magnetic fields and bending them. Um, and when you bent them, you can, the, the heavy ones bend less because they have more inertia. And uh, the 
would, they would make the different elements would make different streaks of light on the film that he was exposing. And so right here you can see down here there's a streak here from carbon monoxide and a streak here from mercury and a streak here from another one from mercury, singly ionized and doubly ionized mercury. But down here he got a double line from, from neon. There was a neon line that was bending less than another neon line, which meant it was heavier. There was a heavier form of neon. Well, he didn't know why it was heavier. They didn't, the idea of neutrons wasn't quite there yet. But there was some other form of neon that was a different weight than uh, most of the neon. Uh, and so this was actually the discovery of isotopes. So neon is responsible for the discovery of isotopes. And here are the isotopes of neon. There's lots of different ones. They all have 10 protons in the nucleus. And some of them have anywhere from six neutrons up to um, 24 neutrons. Not all of these are stable. Most of them are radioactive. The only stable ones are these, neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. And neon 20 is the most common. It's like 90% of all the neon. And neon uh, 22, the other one that J.J. Thompson saw, is about 10% of the, uh, all the neon around. The middle one, neon 21, is only about a quarter of a percent. So not very uh, common. So what about neon's density? The density of neon gas, it weighs about 0.9 grams per cubic liter, well, per liter. If you compare that to air, you would see that air actually weighs a lot, weighs more, quite a bit more, 1.2 grams per liter. That means that if you have a liter of neon gas and a liter in, inside of a liter of air, the neon gas is going to float. So if you could make a balloon that was thin enough, that didn't weigh very much, a neon balloon would actually float. Not as good as a helium balloon, because a helium is even less dense than neon. On the other hand, the density of liquid neon is actually greater than the density of water. So um, there's a little difference there. Okay, I mentioned that uh, neon is made in stars, mainly large stars, and it's, a it's kind of a complicated process. It's a process called the alpha process or the alpha ladder. I'm sorry about the blurriness of the slide here. Um, but uh, the top line there, you see if you take a carbon atom and you add a helium nucleus to it, an alpha particle, you you smash them together, you get an atom of oxygen. And then the second line, if you t take an atom of oxygen, you add a helium nucleus, you get, yes, an atom of neon. So neon is actually, and then, and so on. We're not going to go through this whole thing. The neon was the important part there. So neon is made in large stars. They have to be at least three times the size of our sun and have a core temperature of about 10 times what our sun has, about 100 million degrees. So it's only made in fairly large stars. So let's go to the periodic table because that, that green column there is the column that we call the noble gases. <clears throat> that means helium and neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and yes, our new element, unun octium, joins the periodic table as a new noble gas, although we'll never actually have enough of it to actually have a container of it, and that may be a good thing. Uh, Remember that the atom decays, its half-life is, uh, what was it, five milliseconds? So it's kind of hard to keep it around. And those are noble gases because they don't want to participate in any chemistry, which is why I thought tonight's talk would be really dull, because neon does not have any chemistry associated with it. It's just neon. That's it. Neon. There's no, nothing we can do with it. It doesn't, it doesn't actually combine with anything. Why? because its outer shell is full. If you look at the kind of electron configurations, here I have the first three of the noble gases, uh, uh, helium, neon, and argon. The inner orbit of, the inner orbital of, uh, of helium can only hold two electrons, and no more, no less. Well, it can hold less, but it can't hold any more. So it's ha very hard to add electrons to that uh, helium atom. It's, it's happy. It's very hard to take one of its electrons away. It's happy. Uh, neon can hold eight electrons in its outer orbital, so, and it's full. Two plus eight, ten. Neon's ten. And so it doesn't want to give up or take any electrons either. It's uh, kind of standoffish. Argon, same idea. Eight more electrons in its outer orbital, full. Happy. 
These are the happiest atoms around. Now, last month we were talking about fluorine. Fluorine is missing one electron from that outer, if you look at argon, uh, or neon rather, it's missing one of those outer electrons. It really wants to get to, to absorb an electron from somewhere. And that, that um, I don't want to call it a desire because that's giving it anthropomorphic properties, but um, the tendency of the atom to absorb an electron is called its electronegativity. And I still have fluorine uh, labeled uh, with a blue line there. It really, really wants to absorb an electron. Uh, the next dot up is actually next month's element, sodium. It really wants to give one away, um, but uh, neon isn't even on the chart. So there are a few, all the noble gases, they're not on this chart. They don't want to give or receive any electrons. Neon's a really small atom. It's actually smaller than the hydrogen atom because its outer orbital is full and it has a fairly high charge in the nucleus and it pulls all those eight electrons in really close. So it's actually really small, even compared to hydrogen. So let's look at some of the effects of neon. Uh, if we have, these are little bulbs here. What you're seeing here is a bulb. Here's this, for your scale, here's one of those bulbs. It's called, this is a, a classic bulb that used to be used in on-off indicators before LEDs existed. This is called an NE2. Uh, I don't know if there was an NE1, but this is called the NE2 lamp. And if you pass electricity through it, the electrodes glow because there's neon inside there, and you can use it as an on-off indicator. As a matter of fact, you can find one of these neon bulbs. You can actually hold one of the wires, and if you are at home, you can scuff around on your carpet and touch the other wire to a doorknob and the lamp will flash. It's kind of a cool little demonstration you can do at home. There are other forms of neon lamps as well. Actually, uh, I did a little experiment. Since when you plug it into the outlet, it's AC and current's flowing one direction than the other direction. Actually, when it's flowing in one direction, only one of those two little posts inside is lit. And when it flows in the other direction, the other post is lit. If I could stop the current in one direction, I could stop it from glowing, one of those posts from glowing. So I took a diode. A diode is a device that only allows electricity to flow one way. And so you can see here that on the right-hand picture, only one of the posts is glowing. And that was because I put a diode along with it. So only one post. That's kind of hard to see. So I have a different kind of bulb. I have a bulb down here, this one right there. Uh, can you all see that? I don't know if I can pull this up much higher. This is another neon bulb. You can see that beautiful orange color of neon glowing. That's a, an, uh, what do they call an R2A bulb. And you can, this bulb is actually in that exhibit right there. Um, it has two electrodes as well. You can see the two D-shaped electrodes there. And I thought, oh, let's take a diode and let's do the same thing with that. Maybe you'll be able to see it better. So I did that. And I put a little diode. There's the diode you can see there in the, in the pull out at the top. And look at that, only one of those electrons glows because the current is only flowing in one direction. Uh, if I sw swap the clip leads around so the current is flowing in the opposite direction, yes, you probably guessed it by now, the other electrode gl glows. So it's kind of fun with neon lamps. The first fellow to actually, do I have other neon? I do have other neon up here. Let's see. I have a, this, this is neon too. That's the beautiful color of neon. And the first guy to actually do this kind of thing was this fellow here, um, Georges Claude. In 1910, he had uh, tubes filled with neon, and he said, we can use this to light things. And he was, the, he was inspired by uh, these tubes, which were made, these are called Geissler tubes. They were invented by who, Paul? Dr. Tube, right? Yes. Um, he was inspired by these tubes with gases in them that lit up different colors, but he had neon, which was really bright compared to all the other gases. As you can see down here, actually, I have a little thing. It has helium, neon, argon, krypton. Oops. What was that? Uh, oh, I see. You have a, a camera there. Very good. Maybe we can get that on the screen. That would be good. There we go. Sort of sideways. I don't know if I can turn this around very much for you. There we go. Actually, the camera is showing it up a lot better than the human eye shows it. So each, those are each one of those, made of each one of those gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon in the bottom there. Uh, those are uh, 
those are the actual colors, but you'll notice neon is by far the most efficient in turning electricity into light. And this fellow, Georges Claude, um, inspired by Geisler's tubes, used the uh, lighting, used that to light in uh, the very first time in public in the Paris Motor Show of 1910. He then designed a couple of more signs for commercial use, and in 1912 was the first, we think, documented use in a Paris barber shop to advertise um, and using neon to, as a lighting source. He wanted to put it in homes, but nobody wanted this color of light in their home, um, which is, uh, I think, pretty obvious why. So he produced tubes that kind of look like this, these neon signs. We're going to talk a little bit more about this kind of plasma art in the second part of our uh, talk tonight uh, with Ed Kirshner. Neon is, of course, used commercially now everywhere, uh, uh, except I want to say that although we call all of these things neon signs, neon is only this color this color, the reds that you see here, that's neon. The rest of these are produced a different way where you take uh, like a fluorescent light, you put uh, argon and mercury inside of a fluorescent tube and the mercury produces a lot of ultraviolet light and the powder on the inside of the tube glows in the case of lamps that we have in our house, white. But you can see that, uh, for instance, the blue there is a, a phosphor that glows blue when ultraviolet light hits it, or the uh, green olive in the cocktail uh, glass there, or the yellow. Uh, the only, the only this color here is actually a neon sign, so the rest of them are not technically neon. Uh, that red glow is because it has a, a spectrum that is pretty much dominated on the red end. If you looked at this through a pair of diffraction grating glasses, um, you've seen the rainbow glasses, you would see this. And you can see that oh, there's a ton of lines over in the red and the orange and the yellow. There's one green line and there's, these actually are ultraviolet over here. These are actually not visible to your, to your naked eye. Uh, but that green line is totally wiped out by all the other reds and oranges and yellows. So you really, you have to use that those rainbow glasses to see that green being given off by neon. Um, where can you see neon inside the museum? Well, you can see the neon spectrum actually over across the way in the spectrum exhibit. Um, it's on the other side of the museum. Uh, we have a, uh, a really nice exhibit here by uh, Norman Tuck. Uh, it's a uh, exhibit, I forget what it's called. I have to look here. Can you see what that says? Part, your turn counts, thank you. And there is neon in this exhibit. If you look at the one, two, three, fourth digit over, there is a neon digit. That neon digit is uh, called a Nixie tube, and it has 10 wires in it that are shaped in the, the shape of numbers, numerals, and you energize whichever one you want to glow, and you get a numeral out. Numeral out. This is a pretty large Nixie. They also come smaller as well. As a matter of fact, they come so small, you could actually make a digital watch out of Nixie tubes. Yes, you can. And there's one guy who I used to go to computer club with who actually has a Nixie watch. You may recognize him here. This is Steve Wozniak. And he has on his wrist a Nixie tube neon glowing wristwatch. That, I mean, Steve is total geek, and, and, it's, and, he, and he's proud of it. I like the fact that he displays it. Um, we have uh, other really wonderful exhibits here that were done by Christian Schies, um, uh, Lumen Illusion and, uh, and Kinetic Light. These are, uh, one of them is, uh, you go this way, there's one down this way and one down this way. Uh, we also have a really cool exhibit, the spark chamber across the way here that actually is filled with neon and when a cosmic ray goes through the chamber, they charge a high voltage plate and the spark that jumps from plate to plate is through neon so it has that nice uh, orange color. That's the one on the left. This is a more classic um, spark chamber right here that actually has some sparks running through it and that's also with neon. Uh, an application that uh, is near and dear to my heart is the laser. And here is a, uh, a small laser, and in this tube, may recognize that glow. In this tube, there is, are two gases. 
helium and neon. Yeah, actually, you can see it might be a combination of the whitish helium and the reddish neon down there. And the excitation states of neon are what give you this, the, the laser beam that comes out of the uh, tube. And this requires all kinds of fancy high voltage power supplies. It's, um, it's nothing like what the, our lasers are now. Our, nowadays, our lasers are solid state. They're this big, and they don't require a big high voltage power supply anymore. They require like a coin cell. If I just put the wires on both sides of the coin cell here, you can see that I can, I can make a laser with, with just, a, just a simple three volt battery, no high voltage. It's, it's a lot safer than when I used to do laserium and we had these power supplies that would kill you. And one other place on the floor, which actually it's in the studio right now, is our exhibit Bronx Cheer Bulb. Oops. There we go, Bronx Cheer Bulb. Bronx Cheer Bulb has a, uh, actually one of these neon lights in it. And it's the, since the electrodes are, are glowing like this, on, off, on, off, on, off, because the current going to it is, is alternating 60 times a second, AC, the um, lamp is blinking on and off, on and off. And if you give it a raspberry or a Bronx Cheer, I hear they don't call it a Bronx Cheer in New York, according to our, uh, our New Yorker uh, uh, public programs person, Fran. But uh, if you give it a good, <laughs> go ahead, everybody, do, now you've been, I don't know if you should do that, you'll spit on the person in front of you. Oh well, give it a try, who cares? They'll, ex they'll excuse you. You might see the electrodes actually move because you're actually bouncing your head up and down. So, um, do you see it? Isn't that cool? Um, last but not least, again, I want to promote this book. It's really a really wonderful book, San Francisco Neon. Um, and you can uh, take a look at the book out there and get it signed by the authors. Uh, Al Barna and Randall Ann Homan, and they're out there to talk to you. It's a beautiful book. It, uh, I've got to see a lot of the interesting neon that I used that uh, that is still up in San Francisco, and they also give walking tours. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much for coming. We're gonna, and uh, we hope that you'll come back to our future ones. We will start up the second part in just a few minutes.